Well, from figure 13, 14, we see a variety of different things that happen through the seasonal cycle. In this uh, graph here, the, the most important axis um, that relates to all these particular graphs is the axis of time. So we see winter, spring, summer, and fall. Now let's take a look for mid-latitudes, those temperate zones where we live here in Southern California, the region between 23 and a half degrees north and 66 and a half degrees north, or in the Southern Hemisphere between 23 and a half and 66 and a half degrees south. In the wintertime, we have cool air temperatures, we have low light intensities, and that basically gives rise to a very deep mixed layer depth. The loss of buoyancy at the surface, and you can go back to chapter seven and take a look at that, but because of cooling, this water cools and becomes more dense and sinks down to the depth of a, the permanent ther thermocline, actually. But in any case, we have a very deep mixed layer. We have very low light levels. We have very high nutrients because it's all mixed up because phytoplankton growth is very low. This kind of deep mixed layer depth and low surface light intensities can't support phytoplankton growth. So in this case, we have lots of nutrients, but we have light that's limiting the growth of phytoplankton. So in temperate regions like where we live, in wintertime, phytoplankton growth is light limited. There's just not enough light and the mixed layer depth is too deep and rates of vertical mixing are too deep to support any active phytoplankton growth. That's the winter season. <clears throat> as we move on to into spring, as sun angle rises, as the intensity of light rises, as days get longer, the average daily light input also grows and increases. And in doing so, it does two things. First of all, it creates stratification of the water column. We have formation of the seasonal thermocline, and in doing so, we have a shallower mixed layer depth. At the same time, because sun angle is rising in the sky, because the sun is rising in the sky, and because day length is getting longer, we have both brighter lights in the water column, and we also have longer days. The combination of shallower mixed layer depth, higher light intensity, longer days, well, that's a recipe for phytoplankton bloom. And due to the critical depth hypothesis, we can see that once these phytoplankton get into this positive productivity, they begin to take off and we can see that phytoplankton abundance blooms, shown by this green arrow here. So springtime is really just like in temperate regions on land, springtime is a time for blooms of phytoplankton. Conditions for phytoplankton growth are ideal. We have lots of biologically important nutrients, we have lots of light, and phytoplankton love that. With the shallow mixed layer depth and, um, again, high light intensities and plenty of nutrients, phytoplankton begin to reproduce, divide and reproduce and grow very rapidly, and the water becomes very green as a result because you have lots of phytoplankton in it. Shortly after that, zooplankton also take off, and as we saw earlier, Phytoplankton are often, the growth of phytoplankton is also tracked by the growth of zooplankton. I want you to pay very attention here to the transition from spring to summer because what happens to nutrients? Nutrients begin to fall very quickly. Where did the nutrients go? Well, the phytoplankton, of course. The cells are absorbing the nitrates, the phosphates, if they need iron, they're absorbing iron. If they need silica, they're absorbing silica. And the concentrations of all major nutrients used by phytoplankton fall. At some point, one of them become limiting, usually nitrate. When nitrate runs out, productivity shuts down. And so as a result, the growth of phytoplankton begins to slow down and the concentrations of phytoplankton begin to decrease. There's still plenty of light and light is still increasing, However, because nutrients have now gone to near zero, in the summertime, what we have is nutrient limitation of phytoplankton growth. So we go from a wintertime condition, lots of nutrients, but not enough light. A springtime condition where we have plenty of nutrients and plenty of light, and as a result, lots of phytoplankton, 
to the summertime where we have plenty of light but no nutrients because we have a mixed layer depth and a strong thermocline that's really preventing any nutrients from mixing up into the surface waters. So we see a decline in nutrients, a decline in phytoplankton, and a decline in zooplankton as well. Well, in the fall, we begin to see shorter days, lower light intensities, but we also see cooling of surface waters. And it's just that little bit of cooling that happens in the fall that loss of buoyancy that causes sinking of surface waters, it causes a deepening of the mixed layer depth, but more importantly, it causes destratification, a breakdown of the thermocline, and some of these rich nutrient waters that are below the mixed layer depth begin to mix up into the surface waters, and as a result of that, we get a little bump in nutrients. And that bump in nutrients is just enough to kick off what we call a fall bloom. And of course, that fall bloom, because phytoplankton are now kicking up a little bit, it also stimulates a fall bloom many times in zooplankton. So the fall situation is similar to spring, but not quite, because now light levels are beginning to tail off a little bit. And the water column is still slightly stratified, although it's been mixed up a little bit, and we're having a little bit more nutrients available in surface waters. So spring fall blooms tend to be just a little bit less intense uh, and less dramatic than the spring blooms. But in temperate waters, again, because of the physical conditions of the water column, this onset of stratification, the formation of the thermocline, the shallowing of the mixed layer depth, all those things plus nutrients result in phytoplankton growth. The removal of nutrients by phytoplankton, stripping those nutrients out of the surface waters, the continued stratification of of the water column in the summertime, those warm summertime temperatures uh, and that strong thermocline preventing nutrients from coming up mean we have nutrient limited growth in the summer. And in the fall then that begins to break down a little bit and then we have a slight bump in phytoplankton and zooplankton as a result again of physical conditions, a loss of buoyancy through cooling, a turning over the water column, a mixing up of some nutrients, and just enough light, just enough nutrients, we get just enough, just a little bit of phytoplankton. Of course, in winter, it starts all over again. We have lots of cooling, deepening of the mixed layer depth, lots of vertical mixing, uh, no light or very low light levels available for phytoplankton. And as a result, then, phytoplankton concentrations fall down to their wintertime levels. So take a look at this figure. Read the bullet points on the side over here. Follow what's happening with average daily light input, concentrations of nutrients, the abundance of phytoplankton and zooplankton, the surface water temperatures, the vertical profile of temperature, and in particular, the depth of the mixed layer depth, okay, and the changing the mixed layer depth through the seasons, and also following the depth of the photic zone, all right, which actually gets deeper with summertime, um, particularly when the phytoplankton clear out, and as well the mixed layer depth here showing getting shallower and then deeper. This seasonal cycle in productivity of phytoplankton, again caused by physical processes and also um, chemical processes that alter what's limiting phytoplankton growth, but this process is responsible for the change in color that you observe in the ocean on an annual cycle. Usually during summer, the water is nice and clear and nice and blue. During winter time, we also get nice clear water that's nice and blue. But in spring and fall, because of the presence of phytoplankton, our water tends to turn a little bit green. So this process also explains changes in ocean color. And it's really those changes in ocean color that occur globally as a result of the seasonal cycle that really allow us to track primary productivity and concentrations of phytoplankton throughout the year using satellites that look at ocean color.